Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So, uh, for those of you I have not met, I'm Pat Walsh. That's my wife, Annie, right there. Hi, Annie. <laughs> and we've been coming here for, what, 14, 15 years, maybe? Something like that. <laughs> so, Luke suggested that since we're talking about God's Word and how it impacts salvation, that at some point I should at least refer to the Bible. <laughs> so <laughs> so what, I, what I passed out was <clears throat> just some verses we're going to be covering. And the, uh, the background for what I'm going to share today actually began back in October of last year when Luke, I, I don't know if you remember the message he gave, but it was on nature and how God's imprint is everywhere in nature. And he suggested, he gave homework, and his suggestion was go out and find a leaf and take a look at it. And I thought, I need something more manly than a leaf <laughs> to look at. So I decided I was going to observe something that was actually a little different. So we have, uh, we live next to a big woods. We got a lot of squirrels running around our yard. And they're always burying seeds and they're munching on seeds. And when Luke gave that message, I thought, okay, I'm going to find something. So what I found, and by the way, I, I just want to say one other thing before we get started here. Some I shared some of this at the men's breakfast, so we're going to subject some of you to kind of a little bit of a repeat. That was kind of a, an abbreviated version. So anyway, I went out and I found an acorn, and I started thinking about seeds. And then, following that message, we had Craig Holmquist come down from Fort Wilderness, and he gave a talk to all the men at one of the breakfasts, and the subject was planting seeds. And so some of the, the verses that immediately came to my mind, well, Craig had mentioned in, that, in his talk that day that he used the term a 12-step process of salvation, and I thought, well, Twelve steps, where's that coming from? And, uh, I mean, he basically made up the number 12. But it doesn't matter. But the thing that got me thinking about this whole thing was the, the process of salvation. So I looked up process, and it's actually defined, if you look it up in Webster's or a pretty good dictionary, it's a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. And... Isn't that actually what God does once the seed of the truth is planted? He takes a series of steps and actions to see an outcome. Just like when a squirrel buries a seed, some of them come up, some of them don't come up, but once in a while they do. Well, some verses that popped into my mind and got me thinking right along that line was 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. So God's word is referred to there as a seed. Then also back in Hebrews 4.12, by the way, I've used different versions of scripture here because I thought whatever made the most sense and was the clearest, I was just going to use those. But Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the dividing of soul and spirit, of the joints and the marrow, and it's able to judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So God's Word is alive, it's active, and it challenges my thinking. I don't know if you are familiar with Dawson Trotman. Do any of you recognize that name? Mm -hmm. He founded the Navigators. I don't know if you recognize that organization. But um, Dawson, before he knew the Lord, he was hanging around with a bunch of guys, and he was a competitive guy, and he went to the Sunday school <coughs> class where there was a challenge to memorize Scripture. 
So he memorized the 10 verses, and then one day he's walking on his way to the lumber yard, and one of these verses pops up into his mind. It's about eternal life. And he goes, wow, that's wonderful. I wonder where that came from. And then he went a little further, and another verse popped in. As many as received him, to them gave you the power to become sons of God. Dawson thought, well, that's what I actually need. So he put his trust in Christ. So that is God's word being active. That's exactly what his word does. It's active. Once it's implanted, the Holy Spirit has something to work with. I, was wor- um, I used to work with a guy at Peterbilt, young guy. He and I used to go to our house for Bible studies in the evening. And we had, I don't remember how many times we met, but we were in 2 Corinthians 5, and we got down to verses 17, 18, 19 through 21, where it talks about being made a new creature in Christ, God's righteousness being made on us after he was made sin for us. So I'm sitting there with this guy. He grabs my arm and goes, I see it. I mean, it still gives me goosebumps. And when Annie came home that day, she said, you know, I knew he was going to get saved tonight. She said, I've been praying for him. But again, it's God who uses his word to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And so, as I'm thinking about these verses, another section of verses popped into my mind, which is Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. And I've recorded part of these here. It says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and don't return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout, and furnish seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. So, again, here, his word is referred to as rainwater that comes down. It's rain and it's snow. And it gives seed and it also gives food. And I thought, I've watched squirrels, obviously, (coughs) and sometimes they plant them, sometimes they eat them. Well, that's what this verse is saying. Sometimes there's seed, Sometimes it's actually food, which reminds me that God's Word is not only active in bringing us to know Him, but it's also food afterwards. And that's really the subject of next week's, should any of you still be here, that's the subject of next week's. Uh, It's how God's Word is used in bringing us along spiritually and how necessary it is for that. But the interesting thing that caught my attention here was in uh, Hebrews 4.12, it says that God judges our thoughts and our intentions. Here, in Isaiah 55, it says our thoughts and our ways, they're not in agreement with God's ways. So for salvation to take place, God has to deal with our thinking. Because our thinking is wrong. It doesn't agree with his thinking. And So, the other interesting thing in that verse is when the rain falls down, you'll notice, okay, it gets absorbed into the earth, but what about when the snow falls? Because when the snow falls, it falls on the frozen ground. So, what that tells me is the word can be planted and lay there, maybe kind of dormant for a while. And as I'll bring out here, that's really what happened to me. And... Eventually, when the ground thaws, then it soaks in and it gets used for what God intended it to be used for. So, the seed itself, in Genesis 1.11, it says, God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant, and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. So every seed has a very unique DNA. So when I plant tomatoes in, well, we're not usually plant them from seed, but um, anything, they were seeds at one time. If you do plant them from seed, you're going to expect a tomato plant. If you plant carrots, you're going to expect a carrot plant. 
Well, God's Word has a unique DNA also, which is spiritual life. And it's His life. So every single seed contains exactly that kind of life within it. And um, the seed is still locked in there until germination takes place. Some seeds generate, or some seeds germinate, some seeds don't. They don't all. And it takes time for germination to take place. And the thing that got me really thinking about this was <clears throat> all these seeds, they are, the life is locked inside of a hard shell. And that hard shell has to absolutely be destroyed before their life can come up. And that's what God has to do with our thinking, isn't it? He's got to totally disintegrate the way we are thinking about salvation. And he's got to bring us around to his thinking. So, I believe, in my case, the seed got planted um, way back when I was a child. But in Hebrews 11.31, I came across this verse in, um, this week, which is kind of interesting. It said, It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. The interesting thing was, those residents of Jericho, if you go back and read that, that account, they knew for a long time that Israel was coming their way. The whole city know, knew about it because she said that, man, our hearts melted when we saw what you guys did. You crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. You destroyed all these kings along the way. And now you spies are here. We know you're coming. Well, all the people in the town had the same information, yet only Rahab chose to believe it. And the evidence that she believed it was she hid the spies. And, and as a result, God honored that. So... Faith has to be put into the mixture here someplace. Hebrews 4.2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them not being faith, mixed with faith in them that heard it. So, when I was just a little guy, my, my dad was in World War II for... All five years, he got married to my mom in 47. I was born in 48. I know it's a long time ago. <laughs> but, um, we lived in Menominee Falls at the time. And my parents did a lot of sacrificing so that they could send us to Catholic grade school. And as weird as it sounds, I first heard the gospel, the facts of the gospel. I heard them in the Catholic Church, that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead. There was no faith on my part in that, because when they planted that seed, they also planted along all these lists of things you had to do, which, well, they're works. And so the, the point of it was, though, that the seed got planted way back then. So that's like it was on frozen ground from a real practical point of view. And so I have a couple of memories just showing you how God's Word is active. So one, one of the memories I have as a child was being outside, laying in the grass, looking up to the heaven. And I was probably, I don't know, third, fourth grade maybe, something like that. But I remember trying to look up and visualize where God lived up in heaven because I thought, man, that would be neat to be there. I remember that. And one other memory I have, and this one is kind of kind of funny. They must have read a story about burnt offerings being offered to the Lord. So I thought, yeah, I'm, I want to offer him a burnt offering. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know where this is going. <laughs> so... I know at the breakfast I said some cigarette smoke and none gave me matches, but in truth I think I stole them from the church. And I went to this field that was, there. it was down behind our house and off to the west. And I remember I made my little altar out of sticks and everything and I found a dead flower 
So this is in the spring. And I found a dead flower that I had intended to put on the fire for a sacrifice. Well, I lit this thing, and it was going pretty good until the wind came up. <laughs> Next thing I know, the whole field's on fire. And so, so I ran, and uh, I hid in our garage. We, were, we lived about three quarters of a block away, and pretty soon the fire trucks are coming. And it a but my, my point with that story is God's Word was active because He gave me a desire to go out and at least offer Him a sacrifice. So, <clears throat> when remember how I mentioned that when the snow comes down it lays on, on frozen ground? We, we built our house in 95, and we moved in in November, and we had kind of a cold year that year, and so the ground was frozen, snow was coming down. But before the snow came down, they were planting our uh, seed on our mound system, and I still remember telling the guys, I said, you guys are wasting the seed, why don't you just come back in the spring? They said, no, that seed will lay there dormant, and in the spring it will come up. And that's very much like what is sometimes happening when seeds are planted early, they lay on frozen ground, and when God softens the ground so that we can believe and it can soak in, we can actually trust in that. So in 1 Corinthians 3.6, it says, I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it, but it was God that made it grow. And that you know that the way it got watered was it got watered with God's word along the way. Which is, it ties right back again to Isaiah 55. It's rain and it's snow and it makes the, the earth produce and so forth. Well, for a while, I decided I wanted to be a priest, believe it or not. And so I went to uh, kind of a prep seminary school for three years till. Well, they decided I wasn't cut out for priesthood. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was the end of that story. Yeah. Well, so in my senior year, I went to Waukesha High School, which is where I spotted my beautiful wife. And at the time, of course, she had a lot of friends, great personality, so I never approached her, I thought. She's not going to go with somebody like me. And it wasn't until we got into college that a mutual friend of ours introduced us to one another and we started going out. But once I got into college and started happening in my senior years, I lost all interest in spiritual things. I just, I zoned out. I, I was more interested in going to the beer bars and hanging out with the guys and just doing all that kind of stuff. Well, Annie and I eventually got married. I think we dated it for, what, four or five years, something like that. And then I had a job at Home Supply in Waukesha. It's now Blifford. It's over on Sunset. And that's actually where Tom Hawking worked, too, for a while. But when I got a job there, we used to hire these guys from New Tribes Bible Institute because they were pretty good workers. So over the years, they would, there were a bunch of them. I mean, they'd work for a season, then they'd be gone. The next year, some more would come, and they'd be gone. But the thing I noticed was they were always very aggressive in sharing the gospel. It was always exactly the same message. And so what was happening was God was beginning to challenge my thinking. I used to get into these discussions, I used to get into arguments with them, and as this is taking place, I was really starting to get convicted about the way I was living, about my whole beliefs. I was afraid, deathly afraid, that if I were to die, God was going to take one look at me and go, sorry pal, it's not happening here, you're not coming to live with me. And he would have been right. So. Um, one, one year, we were going into a very slow time in the winter. So I asked the Lord, well, they had already told us they were not going to hire any more New Tribes guys because it was slowing down. 
So I thought, okay, we'll see if what they're telling me is true. I actually prayed to the Lord and I said, if what these guys is telling me is true, then let them hire somebody else. They hired a guy from New Tribes. And now I was paying attention. <laughs> and he and I became really, really good friends. And we used to get into a lot of discussions about spiritual things. And one of the things that I remember, we used to throw rocks at each other, and it, it was kind of your responsibility <laughs> to get out of the way. I mean, it, it, it's just... That explains a lot. It was kind of, it was kind of, yeah, it was kind of a weird place to work. But, so one day... I threw one and I hit him in the lip and cut his lip wide open and I felt horrible because we were actually pretty good friends. So I went to him and I said, I, I'm going to let you throw a rock at me and hit me. Just try not to hit me in the face. And he said, I'm not going to throw an inch. I said, no, you got it. I just, I'm feeling really bad about this and I'm really sorry I hit you in the face. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. And I said, well, why not? So you know what he said to me? He said, because there is somebody living inside of me who's not living inside of you. And I thought, ouch. But I'm telling you, God was really working on my soul. And so I found there were, there were two issues that I was dealing with. And they were really causing me a lot of trouble. One was, as I was wrestling with all of this, one was that I was hopelessly lost. Uh, one was that I was hopelessly lost, which is what those guys showed me in God's Word. The other was that salvation was absolutely free with no strings attached. I thought, there's nothing that is absolutely free with no strings attached. It just doesn't work that way. So... Under issue one, the scriptures in Romans 3, 10 through 12, they're very clear. It says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is seeking after God. Everyone is turned away. They've all become useless. No one does good, not even a single one. So I thought, man, these are some tough things being said about me. And I wasn't really liking it very well, to be honest with you. And it was pretty hard to accept. And the, I remember this pamphlet. It was, what do you have to do to go to hell? You open it up, and it is blank inside. And I thought, well, maybe it's a misprint. Because <laughs> we were always taught as kids, there were mortal sins, there were venial sins, there were, they had this whole host of things. And they changed that list continuously. So I, I figured I was screwed somewhere along the way. But, I mean, it just continued to change. And it's actually one of the reasons I got to thinking that all this, these rules, these regulations, they just don't make sense to me. But I was having a hard time with this one, this that I'm hopelessly lost. And you know what that pamphlet is really saying? We don't go to hell really for what we do. We go to hell for who we are. We're a child of Adam. And as a child of Adam, his seed is passed along like these seeds. Remember we said that well, like it says in Genesis, every seed that is planted, it bears the same life going all the way down. And so Adam's life was passed on to all of us. Actually, his death was passed on to all of us. For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all, because all have sinned. What that's really saying is, I sinned in Adam when he sinned, because it's like, when my relatives came over years and years and years ago from Europe, as almost everybody in this room, that's where their relatives probably came from, <clears throat> you could really say we came over with them because we were their seed, and here we are today. So that was the real reason. So, okay, I, was, I finally got to the point where I could admit, all right, I guess I'm lost. So then the second issue I was dealing with, though, and this was a really tough one for me, was that salvation was a free gift from God. But 
In uh, Romans 3.24, it says this. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Now, I've got another verse listed underneath it, which is John 15.25, and I'll explain in a second. <clears throat> Jesus said, this fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me without a cause. Well, if you look up the word justified freely and without a cause, it means it, it's the exact same Greek word. It's this little word, Dorian, and it means without a cause. So really what this is saying in Romans is, when God chooses to save me, there's nothing in me that would cause him to want to save me. He's saving me purely because he loves me and because he's a merciful God. So I can't say, I can't give God any reason to save me. There is nothing in me. So, in Ephesians 2.8, it says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Again, this made no sense to me. It just, I, it didn't make any sense that God would give me something like that for free, with no strings attached to it. And that God didn't want anything that I had to offer him. He was just offering me a free gift. I mean, that's what a gift is, right? Mm -hmm. We don't give gifts in order to get something back. I mean, maybe sometimes, but the true nature of a gift is a gift is given free of charge. It's I give a gift to Annie because I love her. And we give gifts to people for a variety of reasons, but God was offering a gift because he loved me. And in Hebrews 11.3, it says this, By faith we understand that the entire universe was framed at God's command. And what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. So, in other words, by faith we understand. So, I was asked, being asked, basically to believe something I didn't understand. I, my way of thinking was, if I can't understand it, I'm not going to believe it. And I mean, isn't that the way that we usually think? If we can't understand it, we're not going to believe it. So that's, that was causing me an issue. So in, um, under, I've got a couple of biblical examples listed of Believing when it doesn't make sense. God actually lays this out in a couple different places. One is um, Luke 5.5. 5. So the background is Jesus is on the shore teaching. He gets into the boat with Peter's there, and they're cleaning nets and all that kind of stuff. So Jesus gets into the boat, says push out a ways. He teaches for a while from the boat. Then he says to Peter, put out into the deep and throw your net into the water. Peter says to him, Lord, we're professional fishermen. We fished all night long, and we didn't catch anything. He said, but nevertheless, at your word, I'll do it. So it didn't make sense to Peter to throw his net in because they'd spent the whole night fishing and came up with nothing. He throws it in, and if you read the account, they had such a great bunch of fish they almost couldn't haul them in. Another example of this is Abraham. And in Romans 4, 20 and 21, it says Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. The reason it brought glory to God was God's word is believed. In other words, if you give your word to somebody and they say to you, you know what, your word is good enough for me. You don't have to sign anything. Well, that speaks highly of my character because they believe I'm going to fulfill what I said I was going to do. I don't have to sign a document. So Abraham had been told by God that he was going to father a son. And he had to wait a long time for that promise to be fulfilled. And in the meantime, of course, he decides to help God out. And... Ishmael comes along, and God says, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's your way, that is not my way. And again, that's our ways compared to God's ways. But Abraham 
believed God that he was actually going to give him a son. And God waited, I believe, until it was absolutely impossible for them to have children. So Abraham is like 100 years old. His wife is 90. And they were well beyond childbearing age. And yet Abraham believed that it would happen. Sarah believed that it would happen. And we know what happened. I mean, Isaac was born shortly thereafter. So it says in um, verse 22 of Romans 4, Because Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead and was handed over to die um, because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. So Abraham was counted a righteous based on his faith in God's promise alone. I, I honestly think that's one of the best scriptures that defines what faith is. Being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was actually going to do. And that's really what faith is. And what I like about these verses is, it's recorded, not only as history, but it's also for our benefit. Because what he's saying is, if you have the same kind of faith Abraham had, in other words, if you believe that Jesus died, it was buried, rose again from the dead, and that was sufficient to satisfy God, I'll save you. So that was another example of a man who believed even when it didn't make sense to believe it. So I, I remember one night, Annie used to work this evening shift, and I'm walking along. We lived on Town Lane Road out in uh, Waukesha. It's our first house. And I'm wrestling with all this stuff. And I'm walking along that night on a dark road. And I'm basically, I don't want to say arguing with God, but I'm having a very deep discussion with him, <laughs> telling him that I'm having a really hard time believing this. But I, I distinctly remember approaching the house, and I thought, you know, I knew God's word was true. I was taught that from the time I was a little child. And I thought, well, I knew I was a sinner and I needed salvation. And I knew that all the rules and regulations weren't doing me any good. I mean, some of the stuff that was bothering me was, you know, you'd go in to confess to the priest, but you're lying to him when you're confessing to him. <laughs> <laughs> There's something not right with that picture. So... <laughs> So I'm having this discussion with the Lord, and I remember saying, if I stand in front of you someday, and I choose to believe that that's all it takes, and I'm wrong, I believed you. <laughs> and it's not going to be my fault. <laughs> I mean, I know it sounds kind of irreverent, but I didn't know the Lord then, and, but I remember having that discussion. So I said, I'm going to choose to believe it. And I did. I chose to believe it, even though it didn't make sense to me. And I noticed that over time, things began to change. And I couldn't figure out what was changing for a while. I'd tell a dirty joke, and I'd go, I've told that joke a hundred times before. Why do I feel guilty about it now? And, you know, one of the guys used to always, he had, you know, playboys he'd want you to look at and everything. And... He put them in front of you, and I got to the point where I went, I don't really want to look at that stuff right now. And I'm going like, what is going on with me? Well, I mean, something had changed, and what had changed was the Holy Spirit had come to indwell, and he's starting to change my, the, my thinking and bring it into line with God's thinking. So, in summary, and I'm going to leave it off for this week at this point, because next week I want to kind of pick it up and talk about how God's word is important with uh, making, helping us grow. But So, 
in summary, there can be a lot of time between when a seed gets planted and when it actually comes to fruition. And the reason this process has been good for me thinking about this, you know, sometimes we share the gospel with somebody and we think, man, why didn't they believe that? It makes so much sense. Well, it makes sense to us, but to them, their minds are blinded and it's going to take a while for God to get through. Or we share, maybe we're the ones who are watering that seed that got planted some time ago and we don't even realize we're watering it. I mean, but... The point is, it's God that has to bring the increase. It's not us. We can use all the clever arguments we want. It doesn't matter. It's God that has to convince the heart. And the other thing is, God's word in the hands of the Holy Spirit is powerful. And it's active. And so once the seed gets planted, and this should be incentive for us to share the gospel with people, once that seed gets planted... God can go to work because the Holy Spirit has something to work with. And, you know, I shared a, um, I shared it at the uh, Tuesday night thing, I shared a thing about when we were moving back from Hawaii, we lived there for a couple of years, went broke, and, well, we're, we're flying back, so we Annie and my sister Chris, I was over there with my brother-in-law. And my sister Chris and Annie had already come home. My brother-in-law, Al, and I shipped our cars over into Oakland, and we flew into San Francisco. So we were, our plan was we we're going to take the Bay Area Rapid Transit over, go get our cars, come back over to the airport, pick up our luggage, because we we're going to store the luggage at the airport. Well, I did something kind of stupid. I was looking for a place to store the luggage, and I spotted some lockers down there, so I just throw all the luggage on, and it goes through the scanner. Well, I had a handgun in, oh. <laughs> in my luggage. And next thing I know, all hell broke loose. <laughs> and I was up against the wall, and it, it was very chaotic. And cop was calling me boy and calling me, you think we're stupid, and all that kind of stuff. And... It's kind of weird because this wave of peace washed over me. I, I can't even explain it, but it did. And this other cop steps in. He tells this cop he'll take it from here, and he took me upstairs to get fingerprinted. <laughs> um, and he says, you're going to be charged, and you may have to come back out here to defend yourself. But I'm up there with this guy, and I don't even know how we got on the subject of spiritual things, but I was able to share the gospel with this guy. So, as I thought about this whole thing, I thought, was that an appointment set up by God so this guy could hear the gospel? I mean, God works in really mysterious ways. His ways are not our ways. And I'm looking forward to maybe bumping into this guy someday up in heaven. I mean, you never know. So... Um, no, I got on that subject, but um, my point is, without exposure to God's word, we can't be saved. It, it's not about feeling good about anything or anything else. It's about having the Holy Spirit change our thinking and convince us of what God has done for us. And what I wanted to bring up a couple things. Here's what the gospel, in my opinion, is not. It's not giving my heart to Jesus. You, you hear different gospel presentations. It's not giving my heart to Jesus. If I'm an unsaved person, and even as a saved person, well, let's talk about an unsaved person. Does God really want that heart? No, he doesn't. It's deceitful above all things, and it's desperately wicked, and only God can know it. And he doesn't want it. I have nothing to offer to him at that point. And he's the one who is the giver, and I am the recipient. I'm not giving anything to God. So that is not what the gospel is, giving your heart to Jesus. The other thing it is, and, and don't take me wrong on this, but it's not trusting Jesus as Lord. Jesus is Lord, but I'll tell you honestly... When I came to know the Lord, I didn't know anything about the Lordship of Christ. Nothing. All I knew was I needed a Savior. 
And yes, he is the Lord, and he was the Lord at that time as well. But I didn't know anything about that. That came later, and if you look at like the book of Romans, you don't see any admonition to give your life to the Lord until you get to chapter 12. And that's for that reason. It's like it takes us a while, I believe. The Lord has to convince us of these things. So what I believe the gospel is, it's this. It's being fully convinced, fully persuaded, that what God has done through Christ on Calvary in shedding his blood to pay for my sins is sufficient and is enough to satisfy God's demands against me. And for me to place my faith that that is enough, that that was sufficient for me. As the, the you've probably seen the little quip, but this is, I think, a good way to say it. It's faith alone in Christ alone. Nothing added. I can't add anything to my salvation. So...